Hello, welcome to A Wee Bit Extra, when we delve a wee bit deeper into parts of the Book of Revelation that are interesting, but which would be out of place in a sermon. And today I want to introduce you to the letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. If you've been following our sermon series, then you know that Revelation is a prophecy written as a letter in the literary style we call apocalyptic. As a letter, it was addressed to the seven churches in the province of Asia, that is in modern day Turkey. If you have watched previous episodes of A Wee Bit Extra, then you also know that the number seven means something. It, there were more than seven churches in the province of Asia. So why seven and not eight or six letters? Because seven is the number of perfection, of completeness. And these seven churches represent the whole church of Jesus Christ then and now. Here's a slide showing the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. You'll notice that they're all linked by a red line, starting at Ephesus and ending in Laodicea. That line follows a recognised postal route, and one theory as to why these particular churches were chosen is that it was the most natural route for the courier to take. Let me point out a few things about these letters that I hope will help you to appreciate what's going on. First, the letters all follow a common sevenfold structure. One, John, the author, is commanded to write. Two, there is a description of Jesus based on the description in chapter 1, verses 9 through to 18. For example, in chapter 2, verse 1, he is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. In 2 verse 8, he is the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. And in 2 verse 12, he is the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. 3. Then come the commendations. For example, the church in Ephesus works hard and has persevered. They cannot tolerate wicked men. There are actually two churches which are exceptions to this rule. Uh, the Lord Jesus has nothing good to say about the church in Laodicea. And the church in Sardis only has a few members who have not soiled their clothes. Four, now come the accusations. The church in Ephesus. They have forsaken their first love. Other churches tolerate false teaching and even immorality. Only the churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia are spared. Five, in light of the accusations, all the churches are exhorted to repent or risk judgment. Six, there is an exhortation to listen carefully to what has been said and to respond. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 7. Finally, there is a promise to those who do persevere, who overcome. And these promises are connected to the promises of the new heaven and the new earth at the very end of the book in chapters 21 and 22. So, 2 verse 7. To him who overcomes I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. And 2 verse 11, he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. So that is the way that each letter is set out. Now let's look at the orders in which the letters come. And I said earlier on that some commentators think that it's connected to the most practical route a courier would take. And that may well be true. But look at this. The two worst churches... Ephesus and Laodicea serve as bookends, as it were. And in the middle, you have three churches of which we might say could do better. Pergamum, 
Thyatira and Sardis. The second and the sixth churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, they are the two churches which received no rebuke at all. So we can see that the order in which they appear looks like this. A, B, C, 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 B2, A2. There's a symmetry. Now, why might this be significant? Because it draws attention to the poor state of the church in general. The healthy churches are in the minority, and the churches in danger of losing their status as churches of Jesus Christ are in the most prominent position. Now, I pointed out that East Letter begins by looking back to the description of the Lord Jesus in chapter 1. Not only does each letter look back, they also look forward to the rest of the book. They set the scene for what's to come. So, for example, we are introduced to the importance of overcoming the world, to the importance of the, the need to persevere in the face of persecution. We meet the Lord Jesus as judge and the false prophetess Jezebel, who has led many astray in Thyatira, prepares us for the whore of Babylon in chapter 18. Finally, as we read about the trials and temptations that face the church then and now, our appetite is whetted for the new creation. Chapter 2 verse 2 tells us that the church in Ephesus had to deal with false apostles. But chapter 21 verse 14 tells us, that the wall of the city, that city which is not a city but which is the people of God, is inscribed with the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Pergamum is said to be where Satan has his throne. For the day is coming when we will dwell where God has his throne. The church today is flickering, faltering. A, 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 a poor lampstand in danger of being snuffed out. But in the new creation, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. As with the churches in Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis, so today, there are impurities within the church, whether from teaching that contradicts scripture or by tolerating immorality, but not in the new creation. Chapter 22, verse 15. Outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. In the old creation, the church is persecuted, but holds on to God's promises. The church in Smyrna, for example, is told, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Those promises are made good in the new creation. Chapter 22, verse 5. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever.